Today we are at the PDAC convention in Toronto, and it's a pleasure for me to have a special guest here today, the president of PDAC, Alex uh, Christopher, with me here today. How are you doing, Alex? Gilbert, really excited to be here in person. I mean, it's been a long time, two years, three months, and some odd days since we last saw everyone in person. So yeah. really a lot of excitement here on the floor, and uh, uh, great to be out um, here again uh, with such a fantastic program for the year. So how, how does it feel for coming back, as you said, 27 months, because uh, you've done the virtual last year or so. How does it feel reconnecting with the people here? It, it, I, mean, I think it's fantastic. We've seen a lot of, obviously, a lot of change. A lot of people change positions, change companies, companies change, new, new opportunities out there, a lot of change in technology. So it's really great to come and catch up with all of that in person. Indeed. And I noticed that this year is actually the first time uh, PDAC convention is doing a hybrid event. So uh, what was the decision process yeah. there? Why why do you do that? So both, and I, I think that, first of all, the convention planning team did a phenomenal job here, basically pivoting on things that we needed. So uh, truly back in, in, I guess, last August when we were making plans, uh, we weren't really sure what the world was going to look like um, come March 2022. So so we had planned uh, you know, towards both virtual and, and in-person conference. You know, when it came up to January 2022 and Ontario government still had substantial restrictions on, we had to make the choice and we moved the convention to June. So this is the first time we've actually had a convention in June here in Toronto. And yes. The weather's phenomenal. Um, you know, and, and but we also decided to keep that virtual component of a conference uh, because it's important. There, there are a lot of people who still can't come to the convention. You know, our, our student um, program is, is is hurt a little bit by moving to June because in, in March, the students are still in school. They're looking for jobs for the summer. When we get to here to June, they're all in the field working. So this gives them an opportunity to, to be able to join remotely um, during the uh, virtual conference. And as well, there are certain countries that people still can't travel from. So it gives them an opportunity to, to um, participate in what's happening here today. And a lot of what, we've, what we're doing this week will get rebroadcast during that virtual component. Yes. So what's the overall theme or any, any changes to the program to reflect that this year? Um, I don't think, I, first of all, I think we have something for everyone here, just like we do in our, every year. So whether it's, uh, you know, the Investors Exchange, the trade show, technology innovation, uh, you know, our, our Indigenous programs, community programs, you know, there, there's something for everyone. Short courses, good technical programs. Uh, so I think that the, ch the change here um, a, a little bit is we've got a bit of smaller floor space, uh, obviously driven by some uncertainty with respect to um, to the to the COVID COVID pandemic. We've only got a three day convention, so we're trying to squeeze a lot of information into those yes. three days. So it's going to be very busy for people, and they really need to plan out their week if they want to take full advantage of what happens here. Yeah, it is very intense. So you mentioned you usually do it in uh, March time of every year. So are you planning to go back to the usual time frame late next year, probably? Yes. So 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 now our team <laughs> only has nine months to plan the next in person convention, which is uh, which is um, which is a pretty short period of time to plan something so large. Yeah. Uh, but they do a phenomenal job, and I'm sure that uh, when we look back out here at uh, convention 2023, that we'll see us back to our full floor space and full in person. So let's talk a bit more about mining in general. So here we're in Canada, of course, the association is strong support for the government here. What do you think Canada's positioning in the world mining space and what do you think Canada needs to do more? Well, I think the key things here is uh, the, you know, the government's very supportive. Uh, you know, from a fiscal policy point of view, they have great incentives here for folks to explore in Canada. So whether that's the uh, flow through share shares, whether it's their mineral exploration tax credit or now the critical mineral exploration tax credit, those things all encourage investment on Canadian soil. So that's 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 really great. I think that the the, the dialogue that's happening between governments, industry, um, basically all of the uh, constituents around um, ESG and a move to a lower carbon or a, a zero emissions environment uh, really say, say that the next couple decades here for, for mining is going to be spectacular, right? We need to go out and develop those minerals that are needed to get that transition going, whether that's copper, whether those are whether those are specialty metals, whether those are battery metals. And all of this um, says to me that the young people coming into this business are going to have a tremendous uh, next, you know, 20 years plus. 
I, I kind of regret that I'm <laughs> at the wrong end of my career for that. Yeah. So you just mentioned about the new, young, talented people joining the industry. So what do you think do we need to do more to attract these young talents? Because I always heard about this, always uh, industry need new, uh, new blood to, uh, to join it, to, to become big, better. No, absolutely. And, and obviously we compete with a lot of other industries. And the, the, the talent we're chasing isn't just pure technical talent. There's talent across a broad spectrum of, of uh, backgrounds. So, so the industry itself needs to flex. And we've seen, I mean, obviously COVID's driven a lot of flexibility in terms of flexible work. Uh, you know, we're working really hard with uh, equity, inclusion, and diversity and trying to trying to get a much better balance in the, in the industry for that and recruiting out of other sectors. So I think that when I start thinking about people that we've hired over the last several years or look at, you know, we've got a lot more people working on data analytics and, and data scientists and other, other, other disciplines that we may not have had in the industry very much in the past. Yes, indeed. The, yeah, the... The technology changes everything too now become uh, even mining the traditional industry has a lot of technology to support too. So the last question I'd like to throw at you is, uh, I see a growing trends in the mining in all other industry is the ESG portion. The, you know, mining is a t traditional industry is trending towards a lot we call low carbon emission. Uh, so uh, what do you think? Uh, are we progressing well in that aspect? Yeah, I certainly think there's some really good dialogue and input from all, all parts around that. I think that there, there is a bit of a polarity to manage here with respect to ESG because we need these minerals to transition to what we need. Uh, so for whether it's electrical, copper, again, battery metals, etc. We need those minerals. We need to develop mines to, to extract those minerals. But but we also put pressure on our, our permitting process with ESG. And so so one gets a little more difficult, the other one's needed. And, and we need to balance this polarity somehow to, to ensure that we actually achieve our future vision of the world. Thank you indeed for your time here with us to catch up and share the insights with us, uh, Alex. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I hope to see you again here next yeah, year. Yeah, for sure. We will do. Thank you.